All right, Jess, are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Riley Leonard had C.J. Carr and current Notre Dame commit Deuce Knight, a couple other quarterbacks, as well as fighting Irish receivers Bo Collins, Jaden Thomas, Dion Colsey, Chris Mitchell, Jaden Harrison, and Jaden Greathouse working out in his hometown in Alabama altogether over the weekend. <laughs> it's great to see, and I think it's a great sign for what's to come. I, you have – you have players of the the present. You have players of the future. You have, you know, your your certified stars, as in someone like Riley Leonard. You have you have players who are trying to become a star, and you know, CJ Carr and Deuce Knight and some of these other wide receivers. You know, this is the stuff I like to see as a fan because it's one thing to show up and be dedicated when you're supposed to show up and be dedicated, right? Like that's what. That's what you do when the cameras are on, like when the NFL OTAs come out, like guys, some guys just show up because that's what they're supposed to do. But when you have guys making plans and making efforts outside of what is required, to me, it shows that there is a, a bigger commitment to actually getting this thing done and being, you know, being better than just good. These guys want to be excellent, in my opinion, when, when they meet up and kind of do these sort of trainings together, because you just want as much time to get as synchronized as possible, get, you know, most comfortable with these, these players. And so when practice comes, you're hitting the ground running. There's no more learning this or that, or, you know, are we on the same page? It's, it's time to go, you know, get after this thing. And so to me, that's the most enjoyable thing that comes out of seeing things like this. I've said all along that Riley Leonard missing out on the spring wouldn't be a big issue when because I know that there was concern about, oh, is he going to get the timing down the, with the receivers and all that different kind of stuff? Like that kind of stuff happens in the summer. But to put together this kind of crew, I mean, this is literally, you know, it's like the three quarterback drill that we always see at the start of practice. It's like, you know, you got three receivers dropping back at the same time and you basically got virtually the entire wide receiver unit out there. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's huge, you know, when you talk about the culture of a program and all that different kind of stuff and, and like a guy like Riley Leonard coming into the program when he did to be able to get all these guys down there and get not just the receivers like Bo Collins wasn't able to be out there this spring because of the fact that he was still finishing his degree at Clemson. So, Bo Collins got a chance to be out there with Riley Leonard and with CJ Carr and with Deuce Knight for that matter. And that's, that's like, what I mean. So I want to play devil's advocate with you here. I want to play overreaction Tuesday here. You're probably if going you're more. Kenny Menchie or Steve Angeli. How are you feeling that CJ Carr and Deuce Knight got the invite, but you didn't get the invite. You're not down there. I think that should show a lot of the writing on the wall to a lot of fans in this chat. Well, of what, but, did they get it, but they couldn't come for whatever? I mean, reason. no one's no one's turning that down. Are you gonna not show up That's if you what got I that? Mean. Especially if Deuce Knight is down there. That's as why well? I'm just trying to. I think it leads I mean, to some fun conversations. It is real, and it's like like USMA eighty seven is exactly right. We we don't know but when you post a picture, you open up the the optics. You open and up the those questions. questions. That's right, because legitimately. It's one of the first things that I thought about. Deuce Knight's there, CJ Carr's there with Riley Leonard, but Angeli and Minchie aren't. And you got basically probably and, uh, starting wide receiver. The whole crew. receiver crew. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a thing. Here is a fact: Steve Angeli and Kenny Minchie were not there, regardless of you know. And who had the most invitation got out lost of in the mail? You know, or, right? Or like who who didn't get the group text and whatever else? Those two guys were not there. But C.J. Carr and Deuce Knight were, you know. So whatever, whatever way you want to go with it, those two guys were not there, and it it is very obvious that they weren't there. But I also love the fact that Deuce Knight was there. Like all these people with with some of the hand wringing that's gone on over the last few weeks about, you know, is Ole Miss going to flip him and all this different stuff. Deuce Knight just seems more Every committed than gets, ever. Every chance he gets, he just doubles down on Notre Dame. That's exactly right. And that's salty set. Such a flex move by Deuce Knight. I've already passed quarterbacks on the depth chart, and I'm not even enrolled. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of honestly, you it's know. It's a thing. It's a thing. 
right? I mean, what quarterback did you feel most excited about coming out of the spring game other than Riley Leonard who didn't play? T.J. Carr. <laughs> Again, there's no coincidence. And he was there. These things don't have – these little off-season meetups don't happen by coincidence. Yeah. That's all I'm trying to say. I, however much you want to draw out of that, that is up to you, but nothing is coincidental. Yeah, but, but I also love the fact that Dion Colsey was there because this is a guy, you know, he and Jaden Thomas both, who have both been here for a long time at Notre Dame, and they're still, you know, sort of trying – like Jaden Thomas obviously made his mark a couple of years ago, but he was injured for so much of last season, and he was injured a lot during the spring – as well, and the fact that those two guys were down there. And, you know, like, again, I think it just shows so much about the culture of the program and the commitment from all of these guys, from the quarterbacks on down through the wide receiver ranks, that they were all there. And there's going to be you, – you know there's going to be even more of that this summer yes. when, they're on, when they're all on campus together, with the exception – of Deuce Knight, obviously, because so he's what do you think that they did in their fun time? You think he took them fishing? Like that had to be. I would think fishing has got to be pretty up there. Right? One of the things that's up there. Maybe a little boat, a little boat action too. Yeah. When you're in small town Alabama, I think that there's got to be some fishing <laughs> that was on the docket, right? Right. All right. So I mean, that was obviously a very cool picture to see, though. Okay, so. After seeing the lacrosse team win its second straight championship over the weekend, which of these Notre Dame football national championship scenarios would you choose? They win a national championship this year, but then they go 30 years before they win another one, or they'll win multiple national championships within the next 30 years, but you don't know when or how many of those championships they'll win. Which of those two do you pick? Yeah, so I don't know. I, at first, I, I, I was thinking about this as like, is this like that classic four-year-old, you know, ex, uh, case study or experiment that you see where, you know, you put an Oreo down in front of a kid and you say, hey, if you don't eat this Oreo in 10 years or in, in, in 15 minutes, I'll give you two Oreos. So you either get one Oreo now or you get two Oreos in 15 minutes. But then the more I started to think about it, it doesn't really matter because what you're guaranteeing me in 30 years is two national championships, regardless of if one comes now and in 30 years, or do they both come in the middle at some point, right? And so for me, kind of, again, I I, I logically probably think about things more than I should. <laughs> I can't say I feel strongly about one or the other because in the end, you're getting two of them no matter what. But if I had to lean to a side, and this was the deciding factor for me, I would take a national championship now because it has been almost 40 years and I think it gets Notre Dame out of the pressure cooker, which is the current landscape of college football. Notre Dame hasn't proven anything in the current landscape of college football. And so I would love to get Notre Dame out of that pressure cooker right now and alleviate some of that tension that you know surrounds Notre Dame football. So we have a mixed bag. Brent is saying the multiple championships. Josh says the second one, which is basically the multiple championships. I'm taking the first one. I'm taking a guaranteed championship right nice. now. Same. And then, like, you know, for one, the demographic of the show says that 30 years from now is not guaranteed for anyone, right? Like, you That's don't true. know what's going to happen in, in the next... 30 years. Now, if you're going to assume that we're all going to be around 30 years from now and we'll see those multiple championships, okay, but that's not part of the question. So I'm taking now, I'm taking the instant gratification. I'm taking the guarantee of a title. Be happy with that championship and then go the next 30 years. Whatever happens, happens. Like the multiples, the multiples don't stand out to me as much because it could be year 29 and year 30 and I'm in my eighties at that point. So <laughs> am I even going to be around for it? I'll take the one that I can see right now. That's the one that I'm taking. Jesse, you're catching some grief Archer, you know, throwing at you, um, you know, for your, uh, I'm not your, trying your, to create your these comment narrative about... or anything. I'm just saying that 
when you post a picture, it opens up a narrative for who is there and who isn't there. We would have not known about this had they just gone out there. No one posted anything. We, it, literally, we would have no, no idea. But when you post something, I think it's fair as people who talk about, you know, this sort of stuff on a daily basis. It's fair to comment on, you know, what you're right. seeing or observing. To be fair, Archer said, you you know, you don't know who was invited and who wasn't. So, you know, you just have to be careful with what you said. And like Salty is saying, and you know, he says he thinks that Minchie and Angeli and some other wide receivers legitimately had other conflicts. And that very well may be the case. But when you see a photo like this, especially one that includes all these current players on the roster and a guy who is committed, hasn't even signed on the dotted line, let alone enrolled at Notre Dame, and then you see who's not there, it stands out. I mean, it's honestly, the first thing I did was was look at that photo and say, you know, oh, wow, you know, who's there, who's not? And it, and it stood out. You're right. They may have had other commitments, and that's fine. But it definitely stands out when guys tweet out a photo or share on Instagram think, or whatever, you know, this comment like of, but you're not bringing up the wide receivers who weren't there. I think it's naturally easier because the quarterback position is Quarterback's the most, the most important position it's on the, the roster. Most prolific position. It's right. what is probably talked about the most in the entire off season. And it's just a smaller position group comparatively. Right. So if one guy is missing at a group of four, you're let you're less, you're more likely to do a double take than two guys who are missing at a group of 20. That's really kind of the only reason I trended towards the quarterbacks. Look, And again, I'm not trying to create anything here. Like, And I apologize if that's the way it came off. I just think it's, again, something that can be looked at of if you're going to post a photo, naturally we're going to gravitate to who's there and who's not there. Right. And so to be fair, K.K. Smith, Micah Gilbert, Cam Williams, not there. Jordan Faison, obviously <laughs> – had other commitments. We saw him on TV. We know exactly what Jordan Faison <laughs> was doing this weekend. He was playing. He was playing. Uh, okay, we get it. We get it. <laughs> we get it. You're mad that he said it. Okay. I don't. I don't think we need to talk about it anymore. But we know who wasn't there. That's it. Stands out. And. It stands out. That's just all there is to it. Fill in the blank. Bill Walton died yesterday at the age of 71. When you think of Walton, you think of blank. I think of his wackiness. You know, all the fun he had, just the crazy moments on air, and just really those Bill Walton moments, right? Like those were one of one genuine moments that nobody other than Bill Walton, one, probably had the courage to do, and two, <laughs> just had the the utmost confidence in who he was as a person to not care about what other people thought about him. Right. Like he had established and done so much in his career that he said, I don't care what, what you think. I'm just going to be authentically myself and have fun while doing it. And that's really the, the biggest thing I think of when thinking of, of Bill Wallen. And then of course I think of his time, you know, under, under John Wooden at UCLA, because that is what formed, you know, the pyramid of success or whatever that is, you know, Bill Walton was a, a, a central role in Wooden's success, right? Like those two things kind of go, it's like Brady and Belichick. Those things went hand in hand for both of their success. And then honestly, I couldn't tell you much about his NBA career because I just ultimately didn't watch, you know, as much, but I know he did have NBA success. I know, I think he did win a championship at some point with the Celtics as well. He did. 1986 came off the bench and, you know, and like, that's, like, I'm old enough, uh, and a lot of people here are obviously old enough to remember Bill Walton playing. Most of what I remember of Bill Walton's playing days, though, unfortunately, were all the injuries that he had and being a reserve behind McHale, uh, you know, on that that 86 uh, NBA championship. Uh, McHale and Parrish both on that NBA championship team for the Boston Celtics. Like, a lot of what I remember is him just, like, you know, like waving the rally towel from the bench and, <laughs> and stuff like that. But because he I, had a, a good amount of like injuries as he kind of went into his professional career. Yes. Is my exactly. understanding. Like Tyler says, I mean, you know, won championships with the Trailblazers as well. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the thing that stands out the most, you know, like you said, the wackiness, the comments and all that kind of stuff. 
the thing that that stands out to me is just what an overly positive person that he was, despite all these things that got in his way from the injuries that he had in his time in the NBA that that literally just derailed his professional career and the fact that he was able to keep playing the back injuries that that hounded him later on in life the stuttering problem that he had going back to you know to his preteen and into UCLA the stuttering problem that he had to overcome just to become an announcer and like he he was a shy person growing up didn't want to speak publicly or you know with with the media and, and that kind of thing and so i think you know the positivity that he carried with him is is like i wish that that's like the one thing about myself is like i wish that i could be that positive i wish i could be even close to that positive like he just very rarely ever you know uttered a, a negative thing out loud, but it could, because he was just so positive, despite all these things that got in his way. And I think that that's, that's the biggest thing that was really, it was, it was, you know, I don't know about you, but I was really sad when I heard that last night. I know there was an outpouring yeah, I was, like that on social media and everywhere else. I was truly sad when I heard that Bill Walton had passed just because he was such an exuberant, overly positive person like everything that you heard from him in those broadcasts even though you know like he would go on and on and say some wacky <laughs> stuff but he was all, he was just always so positive i just think it. at the end of the day he realized that these were young men you know like they're allowed to make mistakes they're not going young men and women they're allowed to make mistakes they're not going to be perfect all the time like they already receive so much criticism for this and that and so like you're saying for someone to just be overly positive just all the time and find ways to just make these crazy connections and analogies. And you know what I mean? It, it, it was just kind of a masterclass uh, all in its own. Yep, exactly. So are there any broadcasters who intersect with Walton? If you made the Venn diagram of broadcast analysts, any, any who would overlap with, you know, some like with who Bill Walton was just as an announcer. So there's, to me, there's only two that come to mind immediately, and I think the first one, he's 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 a half analyst commentator. You know, it to to me, it's like Charles Barkley because of just the the outlandish. You never know what you're going to get in nature. Like if that was an aspect of the Venn diagram, I think Charles and and just saying whatever you want to say, like Charles Barkley, whether you like him or not, disagree. Just like the man will say whatever he wants, and he'll say it with confidence, right? I think that's something that we just highlighted about Bill Wallen. And then I think when you talk about just like kind of quirkiness, over overall enthusiasm, um, passion about what they do, I think you would see some intersection with Dick Vitale on that Venn diagram as well. True. But to me, those are, and I, I know you're going to have probably, again, you have a, a deeper understanding of more analysts. So like the Rolodex goes back deeper. But for me, those are the two that I thought of. Uh, it, Vitale is one that I thought of, and I probably should have included him on my list, but I actually have like, like you said, you know, like outlandish things and you sort of never know what he's going to say. I have Reggie Miller for that reason. Yeah. Like, I think that Reggie says a lot, like a lot of extemporaneous kind of things. Sometimes it's like, what did he really just say that? It's a lot like, of criticism too for it. Exactly. And Bill Walton got his share of criticism as well, because he would obviously, you know, talk for a long time. And it's like, it's like, you're trying to follow him sometimes. And it's like, what is he even talking about? Right now, so I had Reggie for that reason, and I've got Tony Romo for sort of the exuberance and some yeah. of the sometimes nonsensical things that come out of it. I think Tony's a a pretty positive person, though, as well, and you know, kind of along the, the lines of the Bill Walton traits. But you, you're right about Dick Vitale, though. I think that that he definitely fits into that Venn diagram, also. Especially, you know, like for a lot of the positive stuff and, and, and all those different kinds. Of just things. like the the exuberant outbursts, you know what I mean? Just right. like that's what I – those two those, – those are the like the, the comparisons that I draw between the two. Right, right. So it's been widely reported, you brought up Charles Barkley, that inside the NBA is um, in all likelihood – going to be going away after next season because TNT is likely going to lose its broadcast rights to the NBA. So 
Christine Golick, who of course is the wife, Notre Dame alum, and the wife of Mike Golick Sr., the mother of Mike Jr., she tweeted this the other day. Thinking out loud, if I'm ESPN, I'm wiping out my whole NBA pregame and hiring the TNT crew. Give that show, Pat McAfee show, autonomy and get out of the way. So, Jesse, do you buy or sell that? I buy that, and I'll be I'll be simple and quick about this. It, whatever you could do to wipe out that dry, boring, unaspiring, lack of fun crew that ESPN runs out there for all the big games, knowing that they're going to get the NBA Finals every single year, is just an embarrassment. Especially when you have a crew that is like you know this on TNT, your rival network, when it terms in terms of ratings and doing games with it, etc. I would do anything possible if I'm the ESPN to replicate what TNT had going, especially now that it's going away for good, because now you can't even be called copycats anymore. You could just inherit all the work and proven success that everyone else has done for you. So I think it's an easy decision. And apparently Pat McAfee owns his own production. That show, you know, what she's referring to is that show is basically – sub-licensed by Pat McAfee to ESPN. You know, ESPN puts it on its air, but Pat McAfee is actually the one you know, doing the whole production and, and putting the thing together and who actually owns the rights to the show. And I guess Charles Barkley has his own production company and he's kind of thinking about doing this potentially. I think it's really like if, if you really want to see that show stay together, as close to the form that they've got it right now, why wouldn't you do it? Because ESPN has been trying forever to get even close to inside the NBA with what those guys bring with Barkley, Kenny Smith, and, and, and Ernie and Shaq, but they haven't come close. So why not do this? And I've seen, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this before, even if it's not going to be a pre and post game show like it is right now, you could just make it either its own daily show, weekly show, the, you know, the night of games, the day after games, whatever you could do literally whatever you wanted with it and just go in a completely direction with it, completely different direction with it if they wanted to. If you if you did it if you're following the Pat McAfee model. And I absolutely think that ESPN would do it because the fact that like during these these playoffs the day after TNT has games get up with Greenberg every morning, you know, they're showing clips from inside the NBA with things that either Barkley said or Shaq said, or, or, you know, quotes from players and and stuff like that. It feels to me like um, ESPN is definitely trying to sort of play up to the guys in that crew because there's, there's so much uncertainty about what's going on. In the future. Listen, at the end of the day, I just don't want old get off my lawn Stephen A and Michael Wilbon debating on you know pregame ESPN shows. Like there's there's they they have to find a way because you know it's just clear they're giving Stephen A a good amount of money, they're giving Kendrick Perkins a good amount of money. And so when you're giving someone a good amount of money, what do you do? You find tasks and roles for them. So I think that those those uh personalities on the ESPN show are ultimately, you know, stretched too thin because what do Charles Barkley and Shaq and Kenny the Jet have to worry about during the week? Absolutely nothing. They just right. show up to the TNT show, they do their thing, and they leave. And so that has to play into it. You know, people like Stephen A. Smith have a long schedule at ESPN, and I think the last thing that they want to do is roll late into a you know an evening NBA game and knowing that they got to wake up the next day early and roll back into their you know everyday show. And so I do think that is a big factor in this thing as well no exactly fill in the you're the blank your favorite tv sports studio show is blank. um so i stayed away because i think these are easy answers i stayed away from like nba countdown or like nbc's football night in america because those are easy you're just there to talk about or preview basically you know what's already happened that day in, in the in that r- relative sport and then just preview the game that's coming up right but when we're talking about daily TV shows, we're talking about people who got to come up with content every single day. It's not just a focused, you know, here's the one thing that you got to be worried about type situation. And so for that reason, um, you know, at the top of my list would probably be like, pardon the interruption, um, get up and probably like good morning football. And again, 
I give more credit to P, a show like PTI because Good Morning Football is still only covering football. Those PTI guys are covering every aspect of every sport, you know, whatever is, is big in the entire sporting world. So Around the Horn is also a good one to me. Um, I like the Dan Patrick show um, a lot. I like the Rich Eisen show as long as he's not talking about Michigan. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of when I Noted. think those, those shows come to mind. Noted. All right. <laughs> no, and I mean, the two, the two that you mentioned are mine as well, like PTI, because we're talking about, I think it's what, 20, going on 23 years it's been on the air at this point, and they, they really were the – you know, at the forefront of so much of what's, you know, going on in sports TV right now, you know, like in terms of debate TV and the fact that, you know, like the side, the sidebar with, with the topics on the screen that virtually right. everyone does now, you know, all those different kind of things that nobody was doing back then, you know, so that's, that's up there at the top. And you mentioned good morning football and, you know, I'm just, Right now, I'm continuously ticked off that it's on a hiatus for this summer because they're moving from New York <laughs> out to, you know, to Los Angeles. But they've got, just like inside the NBA, they've got such great chemistry on that show. You know, like even though make you make things fun, yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, like you said, they're talking about football all the time, but they'll mix in some pop culture stuff and things like that from time to time as well. But they've got such great chemistry, and I think that that you know, I'm like. For that matter, so do Kornheiser and Wilbon because they've known each other for so long. And I think that that's part of what makes those all those shows so good is the chemistry that they have. And so hopefully they stick together because they still haven't even announced like who's going to be on the show once Good Morning Football moves out to the West Coast. But it's supposed to come back sometime within the next couple of months when training camps start and all that kind of stuff. But I just did we, did, did we talk about this last like? They've done a couple of these shows, both for like for the schedule release and for, uh, you know, like when they did the draft, they've done the like basically what we're doing right now, sitting in front of their computers and just connecting virtually. It feels like they could be doing this show right now, even though they're not actually they don't maybe they, they don't just have need a, a break to do it in. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. <laughs> But I'm itching because there's no good substitute in the morning right now. So that's it. I think that's going to do it for today. Oh, by the way, Brent says he watched Top Gun Maverick on Sunday. No analysis, no comment. Like, great movie, bad movie, average movie. Just I watched. Not going to break it down because we saved all the spoilers. Remember, we made sure we had no spoilers Coded. in any of our Top Gun Maverick top talk. Brent Smith, Peter Gammons is the goat. Okay, Brent, but Ooh. Top Gun. Oh, Sloppy Joe says Top Gun Maverick. Is See, bad. we gotta we gotta end before you go down this road again. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're just gonna go down the wrong road. I thought we got past all that negativity earlier. <laughs> sloppy, it is better than the original. Maverick is better than the original. It's very good. It's very good. All right, well, that is going to do it for today. We're already heading towards Wednesday because we had the long weekend. You're actually going to be uh, back in town late tomorrow night, right? That's the plan. You know, everything's got to go. <laughs> Don't sound plan. so excited. I know things. I know there's a lot of things going on. But all right, hit the like button before you leave. We always appreciate it. Subscribe, rate, and review on uh, Apple. Listen on all your other platforms as well. We appreciate you being here, and we will talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk. Peace.